Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we wrangle the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Ford. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for a poetry review. Dalton, tell them what we're reviewing this time. This time, we are reviewing Death, Be Not Proud by John Donne. That's I don't right. think we've ever done a John Donne on the channel. Never done done. We've never done done. Okay. Um, we've done done a lot of other things, but not done. Okay. I have no you idea what like we're John talking Dunn. about. No, no, I don't like John Donne. J I think you're not giving him proper credit. So, if the cri yeah, John Donne gets some credit. That's fine. But my argument was we read Richard Corey and then we jumped into John Donne. I'm like, that's a transition, man. Yeah. That's oh, a yeah. hot transition. Talking about language. Anyway. Um, I think that's one of my points, actually. Okay. That's a good point. Then. So what we'll have here is we will have two readings of the poem. We will have three good things, three bad things, the best line from the poem, full literary analysis, rating, and recommendation based on the text by John Donne. Dalton, would you like to start it with a reading? Uh, not really, but let me stumble through it for you. Good. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men will go, will with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swellst thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. That wasn't bad at all. I a little butchered. Um, it's hard not to. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death. Nor canst thou kill me from rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be. Much pleasure, then, from thee much more, much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go. Rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep well, and better than thy stroke why swellst thou, then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. I would like to point out that when you said poor death, you had more sympathy in your voice than I've ever heard you have sympathy in your voice. Yeah. Like, um, I've mentioned, like, something's wrong with my dog. I'm like, oh, poor Zelda. You're like, eh. but it's a dog. Poor death. Well, poor that's death. got a hard job. You know, All right. very sympathetic character throughout literature, death is. Okay. Um, never really gets the credit death deserves. All right. You want to talk about some good things, some bad things here? Sure. What are your good things? Three good things. One, if you can quote this poem, people will be impressed by you. Fair. Two, um, whenever you read Dunn, you know you're reading greatness. Um, you understand, even if you don't understand the words at play, because this is sort of a different language, right? Even if you don't understand the words at play, you know you're reading greatness. And three, the death and sleep thing, I think, is pulled off here. Okay. Okay. Uh, three good things here. This is a great example of the seldom used sonnet outside of Shakespeare. You're welcome for that. Uh, two, let's talk about some chutzpah here. Uh, John Donne's a bit of a badass from the get-go when you break this down. And number three, uh, this poem's going to make you want to walk through fire when you sit down and break it down. Okay. That's a good invigorating poem okay strong poem uh three bad things number one that last line is a little bit over the line okay i think that's um uh, when i read it i'm like all right this is why we're reading this this is an adrian poem i think we could get there without that last line though okay all right two um it's a weird thing to admit isn't it the language barrier yes uh and it makes you feel so stupid because those words all exist in the language you're speaking because it's the same language and three, uh, the death sleep thing. Okay. Pulled off or not, it's a cliche. And it's easy to say that now, but this poem was published in 1633, which was posthumously, I believe. Been a minute. Been yeah. a minute. Uh, three bad things. Uh, this is old, so sometimes you do get caught up in the language. The language barrier is definitely a thing in this. Uh, number two, uh, this may be a ploy towards an afterlife, 
which is a bit off-putting. I, I, I think I'm going to talk about that a little bit. That's one of my points here. Okay. I, number three, when you read this and you know it's a sonnet, there's only one man who does sonnets, and damn, he does them better. It just doesn't flow like a sonnet should for me. If I were to flip my book right now to a William Shakespeare sonnet and you were to pick it up and read it, you would stumble way more. You think so? Yeah, just just okay. cold read. Just okay. a cold read. All right. We'll get into it. Uh, where would you like to start? Do you have a favorite line from this? Yeah. Thou art a slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men. Okay. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. You are such a hipster, man. I know, right? You, if feels good, doesn't it? If, if I were to go through any text that we read henceforth and just pick out a quote about sleep, I know it would be Dalton's favorite. That's mine? What do you want to bet? I can, I can, I can forecast these things from now on. I really just wanted, like, since we're doing, like, shirts now, maybe we can do cereal boxes so yeah. we can have poppy and charms. Sleep, stars, and the moon. Yep. Any of those things. Oh, yeah. The night is very romantic for Dalton. It is. It is. Uh, anyway, where would you like to start with this beyond talking about Dalton's romance? Um, I don't know. W where would you like to start? Because I've got one real point. Okay. Uh, let's talk about... Uh, John Donne's got a little bit of chutzpah here, in my opinion. Does he? He does. got a little bit of chutzpah. Okay. Yeah, I went above and beyond because you keep pointing that out. Anyway, uh, basically, he is antagonizing death in this, yes? Uh, point and finger. Maybe giving a swirly and a wedgie. Okay. Oh, I thought you told me to point my finger. No, and no. I realized how well trained I am. Like, excuse me, let me point my finger. Point your finger. Yes. Uh, he's antagonizing death throughout this. And he's saying he's going to face it with no fear. Because death is just a simple process of life. Yeah. Uh, and when you look at the grand scheme of things here, that's, uh, that's a bold thing to say. That is absolutely a bold thing to say. It's a very badass quote if you want to get into that. And especially at the time where Dunn would have been writing this, this was a much less scientific age. A yes. much more religious age. So the invocation of death personified may have been feared for the fact that we didn't have the means to know that death isn't just walking around, right? Okay. Like uh, It would have been a superstitious thing at the time, still sure. Um, but every once in a while, even me is, is about as atheist as it gets, gets spooked, right? Okay. Like um, the other night at work, um, I left an aisle to do something in another aisle. I came back and a 20-pound bag of dog food was in the middle of the aisle. So what is going on here, you know? So I put it back on the shelf, but it was sort of on there precariously. Might have been, might have been just on the shelf weird. Fell off, okay. flipped over. As I'm putting it back on, a ball bounces behind me. No one in the store. No one in the store. This is overnight. It's 3 in the morning. No one in the store. Um, so even for today's age it's a little difficult to really yeah poke the unknown and the right? unknown is scary back That's... then it would have been much more scary okay but i think what, what you're really touching on here is what dunn is known for and that is flipping the tables that is a conceit uh the man was a genius at taking something and saying yeah but you didn't look at it this way did you okay um so the thing that really sells it here is not that he's poking at death but that he's telling death, you know, really, I, I sort of feel sorry for you. Because you're the slave here. Okay. You want to look big and bad and come around and take people when they're sleeping or take people in the middle of the day and, you know, they're just dead. And we think that we're a slave to you because it's your choice. But really, if I'm just a desperate man and I want to stab you and take your gold, I'm going to stab XYZ and take his gold, you got to be there. Okay. Right? You are my slave. Death, you're a slave, you're a slave to kings. Me. You're a slave to kings because kings decide, I'm putting you to death. Okay. So you got to be there and take that person. You're everyone's slave, potentially. Okay. Right? I think when you look at it like a writerly point of view here as well, uh, a death takes from the physical, obviously. It takes your physical life, your physical well-being. But when we're talking about John Donne here, John Donne's immortal. No matter what, there will always be John Donne. John Donne lives through his writing. Therefore, to say, you know, death, you know... I'd... Which goes back to a Shakespeare sonnet, doesn't it? Does so, it? Uh, death, I'm going to take you out. You have no power over me. That is Donne basically saying, you know, as a writer, you do whatever you want, but I'll live forever. Right. So I think you get a lot of good stuff from that there. So he's got that core conceit, which is, really, you're nothing to be feared because you're everybody's slave. You're sort of, you're sort of a runaround, right? Mm -hmm. But then you've got the second conceit here, which is to say that 
We always mistake sleep and death, but really, when we're talking about death, it's just short because we've got afterlife after that, and then death dies. The idea of death is gone because we're uh, eternal in heaven, mm -hmm. right? So when you've got something as prolific as the character of death, and you pull two conceits on that character in 14 lines, it's a hell of a task. Okay. Uh, I think it's very interesting here we're talking about a little bit about heaven. We always get into heaven, but that is something that's big in literature here. So, uh, Basically, you know, the gist of this is, you know, it's no big deal because there is that eternal afterlife. So death, you really have no purpose here. You're just here to do your job. All in all, we're going to be better. Shorter, in fact, than asleep. Yes. You sleep for eight hours. Yeah, dying only takes a couple seconds. But the line here that I highlighted, and you wanted to say that I highlighted it because my hipster tendencies and poppier charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke, why swellst thou then? If death leads us to heaven and we can induce a sleep that's better, what are we pointing at then? I'm not sure I follow. Is this idea of heaven that we're getting at here maybe not as glorious as we think? Because obviously our impopular charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy stroke. Well, I think that that is pointing to the time frame there, right? Okay. You think sleep so? for hours at a time, you, you die for a little bit, but then you, you wake up in the afterlife. Okay. Uh, maybe, I mean, if you've got a further interpretation, I'm definitely open to hearing it. I, it's just one of those little points I like to bring up to you know, get Adrian's, they get the wheels turning there. Uh, it does kind of read like John Dunn saying, you know, this man-made manufactured sleep here that we can create with Poppy and Charms. Well, then you get into the, the, the world of dreams. Is that what we're talking about here? Where this life on Earth is better than any life that you can promise us death, so why should we fear you? because we can enjoy ourselves here. We know it's coming. Uh, there should be no fear towards death, uh, because eventually it, it's all sleep. Because all if, dream. if it is just sleep, then I will dream about something better than life, and if it is death, I will have an afterlife more glorious than anything I have here. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right. Uh, what would you like to talk about on this here? Um, so I gave this a little bit of a hard time for the cliche of mistaking death and sleep. Okay. Right, or for comparing the two. Okay. And I think it is very easy after years and years and years and years of writing doing the same things to say that's cliche. But in John Donne's world, again, John Donne, 1572 to 1631, a little different time. Much different time, right? Mm -hmm. So today, many people die in a fairly controlled climate. Fair. Right? Um, when this was published in 1633, if... If dad was sick and you're on death watch, right? Mm -hmm. You're sitting with dad tonight. You're going to fall asleep. You're not going to be awake the whole time because you got to plow the fields in the morning. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you have a hard life as well. But at some point during this death watch, you will wake up and dad will be asleep. Or is he? Right? So this was a time when that was a much stronger connection. And I think that it, it, it bears some thinking about. Okay. If you're on death watch, and you see the, see the next old paw, and you wake up, and paw's either dead or asleep, how long does it take you to tell? These are mortal moments, right? True. So when you invoke that in a poem, you're putting people in an actual place. You're putting people in this time frame in a real space, okay. which they, they have probably occupied. Um, what about the myriad of things that we know that you might not wake up from? Things right? you might not wake up from? Yeah, we, things that we know, I mean, just, just think about it. Um, sleep apnea kills people. Okay. Am I wrong about that? No. There, there are people who don't wake up because of sleep apnea. Now, we know that today. Back then, they wouldn't have known that someone suffocated in their sleep. Yeah. It was just thought, well, he didn't wake up. And I think that goes back to your original point of saying that this was a very different time period where, I mean, today, you know, if you have sleep apnea, there's plenty of things we can do for that. We'll get you through, no problem. Uh, back then, sleep was a scary thing because you might not wake up. Right. We don't and, know why. Yeah, they, and they not knowing why, that great mystery, okay. that is the problem there. That is what makes okay. it so scary. So would you say that's what John Donne's trying to address then? Uh, well, I, I think it's definitely embroiled here. Okay. I think that it's definitely 
within the piece. Okay. I, I don't know that it is his main thrust. Oh, it's definitely a reading from a different time. So it's a good way to look at that and a good thing to think about when you're reading that, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, so I, like, I had a friend who had a night of drinking with his buddy, his best friend, and in the morning, they, they went back to his place and crashed. In the morning, um, he went out to wake him up, shook him, his body was cold. Never a good sign. Yeah, guy had sleep apnea and got too drunk and died in, in his sleep, right? Yeah. So that is today these things might happen. I had a professor in college who said he didn't feel well, was going to take a nap, never woke up. Yeah. Just went. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it is still a thing and it is still living. And it's very interesting to look at it in that perspective that here 400 years later-ish, math is hard, uh, this is still relatable. This is still something we can think about. But it's on the fringes. Yes. Right. So you have to you have to think of stories like this, whereas during this time that's how you went, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I I believe your professor had a heart attack. Is that did we talk about this before? I, I believe so. I'm not sure. I I've never actually asked right. to be honest. So heart attacks were a thing back then. Yep. Um, nutrition was much worse back then. Yep. Uh, up uh, anything. Upkeep, Everything was worse. was much worse. Right. So how often were heart attacks happening back then? And people were just, I don't feel well, I'm going to take a nap. Yeah. And death that's took it. it. Right. That's it. So it, it, it's, it's while and whereas it is easy to say that this is a cliche and, oh, death and sleep, we're putting them together again. Holy moly, got to read this. Um, boy, would that have been the case. Okay. So possibly a little more impactful back then, although still powerful today. Yeah. I, I just think that it is interesting to look at the differences in times when you're examining a poem like this. Okay. That even even once you get through the language barrier here and you get into this, it would be easy to look past it. Interesting. Uh, like I mentioned a little bit, though, I, I do think there is uh, a good uh, call to arms almost with this. Something that just makes you feel invigorated here because John Donne's basically sitting down and invoking death, uh, which would be a terrifying thing at this point in time. Prodding for sure. his pointing finger. Prodding, po poking his finger and saying... Yeah, you bring it on. Yeah. I'm better than you. Uh, you shall be no more. Death, you shall die. Uh, I, some good stuff going on there that makes you feel invigorated, that gives you a little bit of emotional appeal to this here, especially when it's 400 years removed from you. Uh, it, it still has that feeling of, well, I can do anything then. Yeah, and ironically, I believe this was published posthumously. Really? So, yeah, so, yeah we've got the little, the little date here in my book. It says 1633. He was 16, or 1572 through 1631. Yeah. Um, well. So I, I think that's the first known publication. Okay. But uh, still. A little irony behind that. That's fine. A, a bit of irony and a, a bit, um, do, you think, do you think John Donne would appreciate that? Someone who appreciated irony as much as this poet must have. I would say yes, to the point that, like, I, I don't know anything about the publishing of this poem. If he actually intended this poem to be published after his death, then say. by God, John Donne, you are a genius. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Um, that's something to really look into there. If anyone knows about that, please leave a comment. I'm sure I'm just rambling at this point, but I'm excited about it. Oh, that. yeah. I mean, we don't do any research before we start these things. Not so, a thing. Not a damn um, thing. The comment section will definitely tell you about that if you were not aware of that already. That's so. two now. It's two. <laughs> You're seeking your limit on us, insulting the comments. Is there anything else you would like to comment on? I don't think so. I, I really don't have much more that I can say about this. You? No. Okay. Great poem. I mean... Yeah. Uh, what would you rate this poem? Calling would, it a great poem. I would give this 88 conceits out of 100. Okay. A little lower. 86 threats. Okay. So pretty much on par there. What would you recommend? Uh, try to go with something a bit dated as well that I think would have a similar feel. Elegy written in a country courtyard. Thomas Gray. Okay. Did you just turn the page and take that one? Is that what? I don't think Thomas <laughs> Gray's in this, but now I have to look. Excuse I, me. I would suggest Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night by Dylan Thomas. Okay. Now, see, that was actually one that I wanted to suggest, but I just recently used that not long ago. I'm like, oh, yeah. no, don't start suggesting the same poem every week. You might as well. No one watches these. Shut up. It's not in here. It's not in there. It's all not right, in all there. Right, all so right, we're good. Right, we're good. Right. Wrap us up here, please. Um, if you like this sort of thing, we are trying to put more poetry onto BookTube. Uh, there is a, a bit of a lack, so maybe maybe encourage us by hitting the like button because it really helps us out. And don't comment mean, awful, and nasty things because they hurt Dalton's feelings. Hit the subscribe button if you have not, and if you'd like to help us make more content here on Strip Coverlet, there is a link to our Patreon, as always, to be found in the description below. Dalton sucks. Good.
hey, so while I was doing this, I found this advertisement for free coloring pages. So like, if you wanna like hang on to my Dover book here, we could get you some coloring pages. Not just coloring pages, but clip art, puzzles, and more. Ooh.